Uh, well, let me, let me just first say it's, it's been great to be here. Um, I'm really thankful for, for the opportunity to be here. So um, just thanks to, to Tyndale for, for hosting this. Um, yeah, I'm grateful to David and Matthias for letting me tag along. And, and really, I'm, I'm thankful for you guys for, uh, for being here. It's been, it's been great to have conversations with you. And I'm just really encouraged um, by, by talking to pastors who are trying to be faithful to God's word and, and seeing, just, just knowing that we've, we've got brothers and sisters across the world who are, who are, who are believing the gospel and, and trying to spread it and be faithful to it. It's just, it's just really encouraging for me. So um, thank you guys. Uh, we're going to talk now about leadership in the church. And so if you would, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23, looking at verses 1 through 7. These are the last words of David. The declaration of David, son of Jesse, the declaration of the man raised on high, the one anointed by the God of Jacob, the favorite singer of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, The one who rules the people with justice, who rules in the fear of God, is like the morning light when the sun rises on a cloudless morning, the glisten of rain on sprouting grass. Is it not true my house is with God? For he has established an everlasting covenant with me, ordered and secured in every detail. Will he not bring about my whole salvation and my every desire? But all the wicked are like thorns raked aside. They can never be picked up by hand. The man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear. They will be completely burned up on the spot. Authority, rightly exercised, whether it's in families, or in government, or in the workplace, or in the church, is one of the most beautiful pictures we have of God. Every kid wants to be in in a good home with good parents who use their authority that God has given them to bless their children. Every player wants to play for a good coach. How do people talk about their jobs when they have a great boss? They end up loving their work, right? Good authority blesses people who are under it, and that's a good picture of who God is. Authority abused is the opposite. It's one of the most heinous offenses against God because it lies about who He is. Authority is at the heart of who He is as our God and what He does through us and in the church. The picture of biblical authority is the opening scene of the Bible, and it continues to the very last pages of Revelation, where we see authority fully redeemed and on display in the new heavens and the new earth, where God dwells with his people, and it is life. I mean, this is is the definition of life. It is is knowing God. It It is dwelling with him. In the meantime, like we saw in our very first talk on the church, the place where his authority should be most clearly displayed on earth is there in the church, where, where his authority is obeyed, where his, where his word is proclaimed, where, where, where obeying Jesus is being taught to everyone. So it's in the people who are obeying the Great Commission. And so how much more important is it that we obey everything that Jesus commanded, that we have good leadership in the church? You know, just going back to our knife illustration yesterday, authority in the local church is like that. It can be a source of healing, like in a doctor's hand, or source of provision, like in a chef's hand, or source of protection, even love. But a knife can also be a great source of harm, like in the hand of a murderer. Authority in a leader is like that. And if if authority that is, is given to us by God is used for someone's harm, I mean, how how wicked is that? And just how satanic is that? Think about the way that 
Satan uses his authority. I don't know about you all, but, but, but some of the, the sheep that I think re- require some of the most kind of tender, loving care and time are those that have been hurt underneath the authority of someone who called themselves their shepherd. George Whitfield once said, As God can send a nation of people no greater blessing than to give them faithful, sincere, upright ministers, so the greatest curse that God can possibly send upon a people in this world is to give them over to blind, unregenerate, carnal, lukewarm, unskillful guides. As we look together at this topic of biblical leadership, I just want us to begin with this point of reference in regards to authority. It's very important to God, and it's important for us to understand and exercise biblical leadership. The governing question of this talk is, how can we exercise authority biblically in order to faithfully shepherd God's people that he has entrusted to our care? So we're going to focus on two practical questions related to authority and and biblical leadership. What is biblical leadership? And how do we get there? Uh, For the first question, what is biblical leadership? Let's go to Acts 6. Acts 6, where we see the, the two biblical offices of elder and deacon. Acts 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, notice right there, the the church is growing. And with more people come administrative challenges. Not everyone is getting the same attention. So, So naturally, there's this conflict that's arising. And I think it's good to notice that administration isn't just administration. Bad leadership in this area can feel unloving to people under it. Bad administration can feel like injustice. Not that it's intended that way, but this is what's going on, and it's creating conflict. It's producing division in the church. And in this case, it's between two different ethnicities. So verse 2. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, typically, I don't know about you, this is the way I I tend to operate, is that when problems arise, I, I immediately want to fix them. You know, so we got a problem here, and it's this, okay, let's come up with a solution. Let's, let's fix this. But what's really interesting here is that while facing conflict in the church and these administrative problems, the apostles don't immediately fix it themselves. And I mean, if, if there's ever a, a time for the apostles to insert their authority, their apostolic authority, and just settle the matter quickly, we're apostles, you know, let's come up with a solution. Let's just fix this. This is, this is that time. They're the apostles. And yet they don't do that. Instead, they equip others. Why? Because it's not right for them to neglect the ministry of the word in prayer. This is an aspect of their leadership on display here. They're not going to ignore the problem, but but this is how they're going about it. And in verses 5 and 6, we see that the congregation is pleased with the proposal. They, They choose seven from among them to serve as deacons. And then look at the result of this in verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So what's the result of protecting the apostles' ministry of the word and prayer and delegating the, the works of service to some other people in the church? The word of God spread. And many people are added to the church's number. What does that tell you about protecting the pastor's ministry of the word and prayer? So as we consider biblical church leadership in the church and its effect on the church's life together, I think we should begin by thinking about how the apostles viewed their own responsibilities and what they knew was essential to life, health, and growth of the church. So just contrary to to many conferences and seminary courses and business practices, I just think what maybe our our natural experience 
uh, based on what we observe in, in many contexts, would suggest growth and life and health here doesn't depend on being super skilled or charismatic or having a great idea or learning to compromise. Here, life, health, and growth of the church depended on the, the leaders staying devoted to their main responsibility in their, in their case, to the ministry of the word and prayer. And it's not like these other matters were unimportant. And think about what we're talking here. We're talking about widows getting fed. That's, that's important. We're, we're looking at conflict in the church. I mean, so if you think about our, our, our very first talk, and, and then even just the time in Ephesians 4, this is, this is about unity in the church and, and love for the church being put on display. This is, this is really important. Things that are absolutely necessary to displaying the gospel. It's just that they got there by functioning as elders and deacons. So now we want to look at elders and then we'll look at deacons. What, what does this mean for elders? And, and since the New Testament uses the word elder interchangeably with pastors or overseers, we're, I'm just, we're, that we mean the same thing, so I'm, but I'm going to say elders the whole time. I, I wanted to describe the ministry of an elder in three different ways. It's a ministry of gathering, a ministry of the word, and a ministry of equipping. We call the sheep together, we teach the sheep, and in so doing, we equip the sheep for works of ministry. So let's just start by thinking about this aspect of eldering that, that really often gets overlooked, but, but goes to the heart of what the elders do because it goes to the heart of what God's doing in all of redemptive history and what Jesus specifically came to do. And that's to, to gather a flock and to protect that flock to the, to the very end. One of the main condemnations that God levels against the bad shepherds of the Old Testament is that they're scattering the flock. And actually, when you see God's judgment come among his people, what does he do? He, he scatters them. When God is redeeming them out of Egypt, he's gathering them. Well, just hear this in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6. My people have become lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have made them turn aside on the mountains. They have gone along from mountain to hill and have forgotten their resting place. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing. And sure enough, when Jesus comes, he, ad he identifies himself as the good shepherd who's, who's gathering the sheep. They, they, they know his voice. And they follow him. But not only that, he protects them. He knows each of them by name. He's the shepherd who will leave the 99 in order to track down that one who's going astray. And then he tells his father that he hasn't lost any of the sheep the father gave him. So what's the job of an elder? It's to be an under-shepherd of this good shepherd. It's to be a shepherd like him. Paul tells the elders in Acts, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Acts 20, verse 28. And Peter says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This means that you will give an account for every sheep in your church placed under your care. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Are you and your fellow el elders prepared to give an account for every member of your flock? Every one. You need to know who they are. If we went through every name of your membership list, would would, would you or one of your elders be able to, to give an account for how each one of those people are doing spiritually right now? 
Would one of you be able to re- account for who's building into that person's life in the church? Who's, who's discipling them? Who's watching out for every member? Who's, who's guarding them in case they're wandering away? Is, is, is your church prepared to, to go after them in, in love so they might continue following Jesus? Are you, are you ready to go after them? Do you know how to speak to that specific sheep in order to win them back? I'm not sure why so many pastors have lost sight of this basic biblical expectation for shepherds to, to know all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. But, but if we're going to be good leaders, we need to recover that. To quote that old Scottish pastor, John Brown, again, that I told you about yesterday, I went and I hunted down this, this quote for him. Again, he's writing to a young minister and he said, I know the vanity of your heart and that you will feel mortified that your congregation is very small in comparison with those of your brethren around you. But assure yourself on the word of an old man that when you come to give an account of them to the Lord Christ at his judgment seat, you will think you have had enough. And Grace Harbor Church isn't a huge church, but it's big enough for me. We have enough visitors that you might be able to miss a Sunday or two without someone noticing. But by God's grace, when we gather together as elders and we go through our membership one by one over the course of several member, uh, uh, of men, uh, elders' meetings, one of the elders can tell you how that sheep is doing. And if we can't, which, which does happen, then someone gets assigned right away to go after them and just find out how they're doing. Not necessarily assuming they're doing bad, but we, just, we want to know how that sheep is doing. And part of what helps this process is, is to give the elders opportunities to, to teach in your church because as, as, they, as they have a teaching ministry, the sheep will want to come to them. That makes their job easier. Uh, we have them teach part of our, our membership classes or uh, as someone comes into the church, they, they meet with one of the elders. So we'll have various elders do that because we're, we're trying to let the sheep know all of their pastors. We also devote... A, a large portion of our elders' meetings to strategically working through the membership directory, both praying for people name by name and, and checking in to make sure they're, they're doing okay. Well, that's the ministry of gathering, uh, but the next ministry is ministry of the Word. Once the sheep are gathered, what do you do then? And how do you protect them to the end so that they don't wander astray? Well, it's what Matthias was talking about earlier. You, you feed them. In fact, just think about when, when and why the church is gathering. I love this image. Is that the, the, the Bible is being opened up. The, the Word is opened and the, the church is created. The people are gathering because there's, there's food being set before them. That, that's what we're doing. We're opening the, the Word, which is creating the church, but it's also feeding the sheep. In an interview that Nine Marks did with uh, John MacArthur, uh, you can, which you can find on the, the Nine Marks website, uh, Mark Dever asks M- MacArthur how in the world he finds time in his weekly schedule to pastor a very large church, preach twice a week, author over 50 books, run a seminary, and then do many other things. And M- MacArthur's answer indicated that he shared something of the apostles' faith and the power and sufficiency of God's word uh, when he said that all he's basically done is preach. <laughs> Over the years, people have come to him and they've said, hey, how about a radio program? Or, hey, how about running this seminary? And every time MacArthur replied, okay, f- fine, if you, if you want to do it. But he doesn't let things distract him from preparing God's Word. Mondays are staff meetings, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Wednesdays are devoted to preparing the Sunday morning sermon, Thursdays and Fridays are devoted to preparing the Sunday evening sermon, Saturday he golfs. But he said things, things would not have gotten done if others didn't do those other things. He's, he's just the truth guy, he said. He's just devoted himself to the ministry of the Word. I remember when I was at, uh, getting ready to leave Capitol Hill Baptist Church after being, on, um, being there for a few years, I was walking around with, with, with Mark. And um, again, we're not trying to lift Mark up as, I don't know, not, we, we don't worship people, it's just, and it's, it's a coincidence that nine Marks Ministries and he has the same first name, so to speak. But um, it's not related, right? Uh, but he discipled me. Anyway, we're walking around the church and, uh, 
And I just was reflecting on my time there talking to him. And I said, you know, more than anything else, I just want to see something like this in Providence. And I didn't mean the, the building or the size of the church. I, I meant the kind of church family that the Word had created. And that's what Mark said after, right after it. He said, just keep in mind, this didn't happen overnight. It, it takes the Word many years to do this kind of work. So you just concentrate on preaching faithful sermons each Sunday. And then he said, which was really helpful, I don't need to hit a home run every single Sunday. I just need to consistently get up to the, to the pulpit and just keep hitting singles. You know, and over time, as... As you just hit singles, frowning the bases, this is a baseball analogy, um, you will see the Lord do his work. It reminded me of how Mark said that when he first came to CHBC, that he was committed to letting everything in the church fail but the preaching of the word. Don't get distracted by other work that needs to get done. Biblical leadership equips others to do the work so that your main ministry of preaching and prayer won't suffer. And so neither will the, whole, the ministry of the whole church suffer. I was recently talking with a, a group of men looking for help in finding a, a new pastor for their church in, in New York City. And this church has a, has a rich history on 57th Street in Manhattan. So um, from its front doors, if you, if you know about Carnegie Hall, I mean, you're looking across the street at Carnegie Hall. Central Park is just one block away. Rockefeller Center is down the street. Trump Tower's there. So it's just, it's just quite the place. And it has millions of dollars in endowment. It has lots of staff. It's got a large building. There's all kinds of stuff you could do here. And, and so I told them, you need to make sure that you don't find a pastor off a resume list because you that will, you will likely attract the wrong person. Just given where that church is and what they have, that, that this, I, I told them what you want to find is someone who's not going to be distracted by any of that, but have a laser focus on the ministry of word and prayer. Specifically, they needed someone who's going to be narrow-minded and wide-hearted. In other words, I, I told them you, you want somebody that knows what they believe, just has conviction about that, and so they know where they, that they, the ch church needs to go and will be committed to getting there, but also someone who's going to be patient and gracious and just clearly loves the people right where they are, and so will preach the word in such a way that it's consistent and loving, so that the word, at, at the rate that the Spirit tends to work in that church, will be able to do its work over time. In other words, he'll preach, pray, love, and stay. And you know, that's served me well in my own context. Um, when I went to Providence to plant a church, there were lots of other guys trying to do the same thing, and it was easy for me to look around at them and see that they were growing quicker, and that was, I, was, I would just wonder, uh, should I be doing something different, or should I be doing something more? You know, so there's just, you, you look around, I don't know if this is you at all, you see other churches growing, and, and you can have the conviction that the Word will do its work, and I just need to keep preaching this, but, but, but maybe there's, there's something else too, you know, that I, I ought to be doing. It was tempting to try and do whatever was working for them, especially when I felt like nothing was working for me. And you can ask me about my church planting skills later. Um, according to the church planting books, I'm just, I'm just not... I'm not a good church planter. I think I was, I was the worst. Derek and I have reflected on this some. Um, I, just, I just wasn't good. There are things I should have been doing I wasn't. Like, just for example, so I'm not just saying this, I'll give you an idea of what this was like. If you're, if you're going to try and start a church, people should probably know you exist. And so it's not a bad idea to have a website. That's generally a good idea these days. And then, and if somehow people find where you're at, sort of generally, they know you're in this area of the city, it's not a bad idea to have a sign. So that, so that even if they figure out which particular hotel you're in, that once they get in there, they know where to go in the hotel. It would have been good if I did all of those things. Um, but we didn't, we didn't. I, I just, I'm not, that was a mistake. <laughs> but what we did do well, I think, is that we, we prayed and we evangelized 
We, we taught the word. The church gathered around the world, word. We, we, we concentrated on loving one another. A and so we did, by God's grace and miraculous work, just slowly and steadily grow. And Lord willing, that we'll, we'll find that principle to, to be true for our church, that the strength and health of the church will be related to the time it took to building it. And not only that, but I just side note, I, I think pastors tend to overestimate what they can do in one year, but underestimate what they can do in 20. My first five years of church planting were all about survival. I didn't know if we were going to make it. And then the, in the last five years, we're, we're now getting ready to plant our third church. And the really encouraging thing about that related in relationship to what we're talking about here is that in that last five years, we really haven't done anything different, much different than in our first five years. We do have a website now. <laughs> um, but, but essentially, we've just been doing the same ministry of, of gathering around the Word of God, praying with one another, loving one another, evangelizing, discipling. Just been doing that. Elders do that. And, not, and obviously not every elder is going to be devoted to preparing that weekly sermon, but it's a, a confidence in the word and prayer, that kind of faith, which needs to characterize both you as a pastor and all the other elders you serve with. They may not preach on Sunday morning, but, but they're probably teaching in some other capacity, right? Whether it's just one-on-one -on -one Bible reading, uh, it's kind of a, a, a teach, some other teaching time in the church, maybe in small groups in your home, but they need to be men characterized by an utter confidence in the authority and sufficiency of God's word in the church and in the Christian's life. That's why if you compare the list of what an elder must be and what a deacon must be in 1 Timothy 3, the ability to teach is the only thing which distinguishes the two lists. So we've got the ministry of gathering, the ministry of the word, but then there's also the ministry of equipping. An elder has the ministry of the word because his ministry uh, is is also a ministry of equipping, and, and that's essential to discipleship. An elder trusts that the teaching of God's word gives life to sinners and maturity to saints. And so he, he, he sets himself on equipping others through supporting the ministry of the word. Ephesians 4.11, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why did he give the church these gifts? First, to prepare or equip God's people for works of service. Other than in his role of teacher of the word, a good pastor or elder is someone who is, in a sense, working themselves out of a job. They start with the deacons, individuals who, like Stephen, are full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and they put works of service into their hands. And then as, as the deacons, with the rest of the congregation, um, Christ gives other gifts, so that, this is the rest of 11, the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So in a sense, a good elder wants to work himself out of a job, even in their role as teacher of God's word, as they work to disciple other elders and teachers that will work alongside them in that word ministry. Very practically, what this means is an elder works hard at preparing faithful sermons or Bible studies or discipleship times. They just work hard at that. And they work hard at, at praying. And then they back off. Or, or rather, placing they place responsibility into the hands of other faithful people. So good eldership means not micromanaging. A an elder spends more time making sure their interpretation of Sunday's text is correct than they do to making sure that everything else in the church is running smoothly. They spend more time getting to know the members of their church so they can better apply the sermon to their lives than trying to strategize for the right program, depending on what programs are. They spend more time encouraging and counseling young people in the faith than devising crafty management styles or strategies. Or to borrow from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, spend as much time speaking to God about the, about the brothers and sisters as you do speaking to the brothers and sisters about God. 
Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you uh, entirely ignore these other types of ac activities. You, you may have to get to the you may just have to get the job done at times, and that's especially true if you're the, the only pastor of a smaller church. Um, sometimes I wonder if, if God's just t taking the, the super gifted person and putting them in that smaller church where they're just going to have to kind of do everything. <laughs> you know. But the Lord promises to bless the preaching of his word and not perfect programs. And yet in my personal experience, the times I spend with other pastors seems like we're talking more about things, other things the church could be doing, other ideas to, to get the church going, other ideas that, that will fix the problems than how we're doing and growing in God, preaching God's word. I think the principles at stake here affect how churches should think about hiring. You never want to hire someone like a youth minister or evangelistic minister or music minister or anything else if you think it's going to give the congregation an excuse to, to not do that ministry as individuals in the church. Oh, cool, we, we've got an evangelism pastor. I guess they're going to do evangelism. You know? Or he's taking care of the youth row. Great, we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about the children in the church. So we should, we should hire staff when we think that that particular person will successfully facilitate that ministry in the body. So we... There, we hire staff that will equip the church to do it well. That's the, that's the job they're doing. So again, when I was leaving Capitol Hill, I remember we were, they were hiring uh, Deepak Reju, who was the, uh, going to be the pastor of counseling. And he was told that if you're doing as much counseling in five years as you do at the beginning, you've failed at your job. Deepak was encouraged that to make a big aspect of his job training the congregation to counsel one another so that if he weren't doing that uh, if he were doing just as much in five years he would have known that he failed at equipping the saints for ministry you know just a quick wonderful picture of elders uh, the elders work of the ministry of the word building up others to do works of service is in Acts 16 when Paul and his companions show up to the, for the first time in Philippi, Philippi they go down to the river planning to pray but instead preached to a group of women, including one named Lydia, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Apparently, so did the members of her household, because they're all baptized. And so a church is now planted in Philippi. And then we read this. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Paul preaches, Lydia gets saved, and then immediately we see her showing hospitality. If your goal is to bear fruit in the kingdom of God and not the promotion of your own kingdom, what better way to bear fruit than to equip and prepare fellow elders or the church to do the work of the ministry? So what that means is prepare your church to be pastored by multiple Elders. The New Testament never suggests a specific number of elders for a particular congregation, but it clearly and consistently refers to the elders of a local church in the plural. A plurality of elders doesn't mean that the pastor has no distinctive role either. Um, there are many references in the New Testament to preaching and preachers that would not apply to all the elders in the congregation. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching in a way that the, elders, the other elders in the church could not. And also, by being just a, a regular voice in the church, proclaiming God's word, a faithful preacher will probably find that a congregation and the other elders treat him a, a, as first among equals. Uh, the lead pastor just has more influence, not because his position is higher than the others, but just because he does the higher amount of teaching than the others. And, that, and you get influence through teaching the word. But still, the, the preacher or pastor fundamentally is just one more elder. It's formally equal with every other elder that is called by that congregation to act in that capacity. So just real briefly, what are, what are some of the benefits of having multiple elders? Well, it balances the, the pastor's weakness. No pastor has so many diverse gifts that they can do all the work of the ministry equally by themselves. You know, other godly men will have gifts, passions, and abilities that will complement that lead pastor. 
it also diffuses congregational criticism. Under one pastor, uh, the, the, that pastor will often take the brunt of all the criticism. You know, and it just, it's no fun to bear that load all by yourself either. But when you have uh, multiple elders, leadership is shared with that body of elders, and, 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 and the, that just helps kind of diffuse criticism in the congregation because it's, it's harder to criticize five people than it is to criticize one. It diffuses the us versus him. That is, the congregation will feel less inclined to pit themselves against this one person uh, when you have multiple people that are, are seeking to love you well. It adds pastoral wisdom. There have been plenty of times where I'm thankful that I was outnumbered in my opinion. And I think the church I pastor is really thankful to have a guy much older than me on our elder board. I honestly saw this change for the better when we, when we brought on an elder who just was full of gray hair. Um, it, just, it was just better. I'm, I'm, th- I'm thankful for that. It also indigenizes leadership. The congregation needs to function and grow even if something often happens to the p- awful happens to the paid pastor. So if you have lots of elders coming from within the congregation and something happens to the lead pastor, that congregation is still being cared for by, by people who, who have been there, who are remaining, likely to remain there, and continu- can continue that work. Multiple elders also enables corrective discipline. Uh, corrective church discipline is far more difficult without a plurality of elders. It, it requires, the church discipline requires a leadership structure that, that won't buckle under the spiritual and relational pressures of the process. And that can be a very long process, by the way. You know, as, as, as somebody is, is beginning to fall into sin, um, and between steps one and two and three and maybe four, that can, be, that can just be a very long time before it's clear this person's just turned their back on Jesus. And, and having multiple elders can actually help you bear with that struggling sinner for a long time in the process so that you do what Dave was exhorting us to do yesterday, which is be very careful and sober uh, uh, really about that process. Multiple elders helps for that. Finally, it prepares more hands to work for the harvest. More shepherds to guard the flock. More hands to gather, teach, and equip. That's what the elders do. What about deacons and deaconesses? That's the next office. Are they kind of functioning as a, a second body of decision makers? No, the elders and, and deacons don't constitute some for, sort of by, I don't know, I'm trying to think of different government kind of checks and balances systems, you know. It's not that kind of thing. What is it? The Congress and the Senate. Oh, good. Okay. We're there. Congress and Senate. That's exactly right. That's not, that's not what this is. Um, an analogy that you can be used, you think, think about if, if the elders were to say, let's drive this car to Amsterdam, it's not up to the deacons to say, no, let's go to Harlem. Now, they could ca- come back. The, de- the deacon's job is to come back to the elders and say, look, we don't have enough gas to get to Amsterdam, which would be difficult in this case. But you get the analogy. They're not charged with setting the church's direction. They're there to, to help support what the elders are, are leading them to do. So what, so what do they do? They, they, they're caring for the physical needs of the church. In Acts 6-2, the apostles characterize the service as, as waiting on tables. They were literally deaconing tables, caring for people, especially for other Christians, and most especially for the members of the congregation, contributes not only to their physical well-being, but to the spiritual well-being of the church. That's what we saw in Acts 6. You know, it, they're, they're helping embody God's care of his people. And that ends up acting as a good witness to, the, to, to those outside the church. Behind the physical care lies this, this, this other aspect of the deacon's work, and which benefits, again, not just those in need, but the whole body. If you look at Acts 6, conflict was arising because of bad administration. And the elders say, wait, we can't focus on this. We've got we've to preach the word and we've got to pray. So deacons, you, you, you find people to serve in this way. And by serving in this way, the unity of the church was preserved. 
So, so deacons and deaconesses can actually be great help, should be great help to preserving unity in the church. By, by caring for the widows, that's what happened. So this was important because physical con- neglect or bad administration can cause spiritual disunity in the body. The deacons were appointed to head off that. They were acting as shock absorbers in the body. And that should tell you something about the kinds of people you do or don't want serving as deacons or deaconesses in your church. They should be the type of people that are spiritually mature enough, like we read in 1 Timothy 3, to show what godliness, be godly examples to the church. Because the mystery of godliness is grace. It's great, but that means they're, they're working for the unity in the church. It should come from the gospel. They're the kind of people that will want to serve the body where, where people might potentially feel a sense of injustice because of a lack of administration. They just want to try and help head off that disunity in general. And the third way that the deacons were serving is they were helping support directly the ministry of the apostles. In Acts 6.3, the apostles seemed to acknowledge that caring for physical needs is a responsibility of the church. They didn't say, who cares? The apostles did care. But they determined to turn this responsibility over to another group by the church so that their ministry to the widows and the rest of the church from the word would not be neglected. So deacons, in this sense, supported the teachers of the word in their ministry. They, they were encouraging and sort of upholding the, the ministry of the word. Who are they? Well, by the time Paul wrote his first letter to Timothy, he could instruct Timothy on the qualifications for what had be explicitly, become, explicitly become the office of a deacon or deaconess. When Paul's list of qualifications shows up in chapter 3, uh, it's combined with the qualities of the individual selected in Acts 6. And it becomes apparent that deacons should be known for being full of the Holy Spirit. They do minister to physical needs, but their ministry is a spiritual ministry. Deacons should be known as full of wisdom. In such a way, like Acts 6, the church is pleased by who's chosen to fulfill that role. They should willingly and diligently take on responsibility for the needs of their particular ministry. So as we think about authority and the way that it's supposed to bless those under it, elders and and deacons are, are serving as leaders in the church in such a way that the whole body of people are experiencing something of the blessing of living in the kingdom of God. It's it's in the church that the kingdom of heaven is being visibly seen on earth and experienced by those that have entered into it by faith. That just really raises the bar, doesn't it? On the importance of biblical church leadership. It would benefit churches to, again, distinguish the roles of elders and deacons in their churches because clearly, just looking at this one text in Acts 6, we need both. Our churches need both in order to experience the blessings of living under God's authority. And when we can say that these are servants because they're using their authority that God's given them for the good of those under it, the church really does begin to to get a foretaste of what it will be like to to be a part of that final gathering one day where we enter into the new creation and dwell with God, living with Him forever under His authority. And that's the kind of life-giving experience we want in the church right now by His grace. So I'll pray and we'll ask questions. Father, we, we thank You for Your Word and the way that being underneath its authority is so good for us for its life-giving words. And Lord, we pray that in your church, your servants, deacons and elders, and our, the entire congregation will be happy to live underneath your authority in order that we all might be blessed by it and that you would give us good leaders that will help us to, to live in that way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.